of the one and only source consciousness, which creates and animates all things. Now, of course, understanding this powerful truth is one thing. Applying this incredibly empowering wisdom to everyday life, well, that's another. Which is exactly why we provide you with a fresh serving of soul food for thought five days a week to help constantly remind you of what matters most. You are it. And I'm your host, Brandon Beecham. I'm the reflection and extension of you who will be here each Wednesday interviewing a different consciousness changemaker and on the other four weekdays leading the way to ensure that your perspective is consistently expanded, your vibration is constantly elevated, and your heart is overflowing and full. Also, before we jump into today's episode, I'd like to take about a minute and a half to tell you about a few sponsors that not only help to make it possible to produce this show five days a week, but that I'm also genuinely passionate about promoting. The first longtime stellar supporter of this show that I want to mention is Gaia. If you're not familiar, Gaia is the go-to source for streaming consciousness content online with over 8,000 video titles. And you can sign up for your first month for only 99 cents at Gaia.com forward slash positive head. That's spelled G-A-I-A dot com forward slash positive head. The second sponsor I'm sincerely passionate about promoting is Purium. It's no mystery that bringing your mind, body, and spirit into balance is necessary if a person truly intends to manifest the greatest and grandest version of themselves. So if you've been looking for a way to easily get organic superfoods into your system every day with a simple plan that can help you reestablish a healthier foundation and relationship with food like I was doing before I found Purium, I highly recommend going to positivehead.com forward slash transformation and checking out the videos and interviews there where I dive deeply into discussions explaining why I take these products every day. And should you ultimately end up on iShopPurium.com to purchase any of their 50 plus amazing superfood products, be sure to use the code POSITIVEHEAD, all one word, for a 25% discount. All right, all you positive heads, on this week's Soul Share, I'm very excited to have Guy Finley here with me on the show. Guy is a guy who has written more than 45 books on self-realization, and today he's here to share with us what it's like to live with a lifetime of severe writer's block. (laughs) (laughs) Kidding, kidding, that's my very bad joke. Um, (laughs) Obviously, that's not a problem for this guy, and he has authored books such as The Secrets of Letting Go, The Essential Laws of Fearless Living, his brand new book uh, that we're going to talk about today is Relationship Magic, Waking Up Together. Uh, he's also the founder and director of the Life of Learning Foundation, a nonprofit center for spiritual discovery located in Southern Oregon, where he gives talks three times each week. Um, he's uh, also a faculty member at the Omega Institute, New York, as well as a regular contributor to BeliefNet and the Huffington Post. Hey there, Guy. Welcome to the show, my friend. <clears throat> Thank you, Brandon. I'm glad to be with you. Uh, I, I hope you didn't mind my my uh, bad joke there. I just couldn't help myself. I'm like, 45 books? Holy moly. <laughs> yeah, and, and, that's that's with writer's blo- and that's with writer's yeah. block. Can't imagine what it'd be like without it. So um, I like to start with the same question and uh, end with the same question, actually, uh, on, on most of these soul shares. And... The starting question is this. You're in an elevator. The woman next to you looks over, says, what's your passion? You have 10 floors to answer. What do you say? My passion is discovering my relationship with everyone and everything moment to moment. 
because through mm. that kind of relationship, I am introduced to parts of myself that I would never get to know otherwise. So revelation ah. is kind of a, an introduction to my own nature. And that's the most important thing to me. I love that. I love that. You know, I often talk about that on the show. It's like everywhere you go, you're there waiting for yourself and everyone is a prop in your movie reflecting a part of you back to you. It's like, you know, if you can sort of take that perspective I found of, hey, they're here showing me something about myself in some way. And a lot of times, when, especially when it's a challenging interaction, that's really helped me to transform <laughs> like, oh, this isn't really personal. This is like nothing's personal. They're actually just playing a role for me. What am I getting from it? What am I learning from it? How am I expanding and, uh, you know, recreating myself based off of it? Yeah, that that's very much on point and actually the point of my new book in many ways that everyone that we meet really works as a mirror for us mm. to be able to yeah. start seeing things about ourselves that we wouldn't ordinarily be able to see for instance when we first meet somebody we love to be around them because without any effort on their part somehow magnetically Everything about the other person is thrilling to us. So we, we continually meet the best of us through that partnership. The, mm. the, the rub comes when we go from meeting the best of us to meeting the rest of us through that relationship. Mm. <laughs> and that's where, yes. things, that, that's where things become very important in terms of developing ourselves so that our relationship can really develop in newer and deeper ways. Yeah. Yeah. I think of that made me think of uh, the the Rumi quote uh, and, and I'm paraphrasing. It's essentially how will your how will your mirror be polished if you are annoyed by every rub? Right. That's, exa and, that's, <laughs> that's exactly that is exactly right. And, and it's such an important thing to understand. And I don't know that all of us do. I think we get a good inkling of the idea. But. Maybe we could explore that a little bit of what is that mirror and how does it actually work and how can I learn mm. to stand in front of it more consistently, more consciously. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, I very much look forward to di diving into that with you. And before we do, um, yeah. maybe you could take a few minutes to give us some background. I always like to understand who, who the heck am I talking to? You know, what led up to this journey of 45 books on self-realization and writing a book now most recently on relationships? Maybe you can, you can give us the, the Guy Finley backstory. Well, in a, in a nutshell, excuse the, 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 the pun. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, Brennan, I was raised in a, a very successful show business family. My father... Larry Finley, actually invented the late-night television talk show genre before oh, names wow. that— Oh, wow, really? Bef yeah, before names that most people now would even know, before Johnny Carson, before Jack Parr, before Steve Allen, my dad had the first syndicated television show out of Los Angeles in 1951, and he wow. introduced, introduced the whole notion— of a host sitting there with a guest talking musical uh, variety. All of those things he initiated. So because of that, wow. <clears throat> I grew up with, uh, I, I was in the mini rat pack. My <laughs> parents, it was, look, my parents, you know, they hung out with Frank Sinatra, you know, the Manellis, wow. the Arnezes, the Martins, whereas mm. I ran out with their kids. So when I was a boy, wow. those were my childhood friends. But, and to the, to the point of the story, over time, I began to have these different experiences. For instance, and most people, I don't know if they know who Jane Mansfield is anymore, but when I was a boy, uh, I, I rode in her lap during the Hollywood Christmas parade. Wow. And, and, but this is the impression from back then, Brandon. We're in the green room with all of these celebrities, and 
all I could feel at seven years old was fear. Hmm. All I saw was people uh, drinking copious amounts of alcohol. And I remember at that age wondering, well, these people are being catered to. We're about to ride down Hollywood Boulevard uh, and have thousands and thousands of people waving and cheering. What's wrong? Why, why aren't they happy? And mm. that experience went with me all through my childhood. Growing up in what was fairly dysfunctional in terms of my family and mm. eventually asking questions, what is all of this pain about? So as I asked the questions, my life continued to unfold. Fast forward, I became the first, my partner and I, first white soft rock artist ever to sign with Motown Records in 1971. Oh, wow. <laughs> I enjoyed wow. a fabulous career. I wrote music for uh, Jackson 5, Diana Ross, Debbie Boone. Wow. Uh, uh, with the, the guy that wrote all the music and produced all the Four Seasons Records. And then I worked with Neil Diamond for several years. First artist to sign on his uh, his niche label with RCA. So those years, up until I was 29 years old, I had a, a, a what most people would say was an, a great life. Home in Malibu, tennis court, horses, the whole business, writing music from movies and TV. But I was unhappy. <laughs> mm, I, wow. I couldn't. I couldn't make it work, Brandon. And around the age of 27 or 28 years old, I just quit. And I, I went to India. I started traveling to see if I couldn't find someone somewhere who could help me understand what I was unable to understand, which is why if I have all of these things, am I still not feeling whole and complete? So there right. is how I got to where I started working and writing. I began as a boy having experiences inwardly that then traveled through my musical career and then back to the interior life. Wow, that's um, that's quite the fascinating journey. I had no idea of any of that, you know, prior to you just saying it. And, uh, you know, it definitely... Um, mirrors some of the things you know pursuing music and moving to california to pursue music many many years ago and actually with this show one of the things that i'm i've talked about many many times is this idea of turning it into a late night style show all with conscious you know conversations around you know consciousness spirituality uh, that sort of thing and having artists that sort of reflect that who perform uh, you know as well so I, to to speak with you is epic <laughs> yeah. because I'm I'm like tapping into the roots of this idea that's been percolating for a, a long long time so uh, very very cool story so you went in in your in your twenties late twenties to India and that I'm assuming you. Uh, that started you on a, a path that uh, kind of took you out of uh, what your life had been, the trajectory it had been on up to that point? Yeah, very, very much so. But And yet, it's all so synchronistic, the way it works. I mean, yeah. I, I love music. I still do. I'm actually still thinking that one day I'm going to write. Uh, I wrote a Broadway show that Universal bought. Oh, wow. That, that we got to first stage, second stage with, but never mounted it officially. I still want to write another musical. But cool. what happened, Brandon, was that I, uh, I, I felt so blessed. You, you know, I'm 21 years old. I'm a, I'm a premier writer with Joe Bet. That's Motown's publishing company. I'm hanging out mm -hmm. with uh, the Commodores, and my partner and I are considered the great white hope back then rare earth <laughs> yeah honest to god rare earth signed just after we did came out with i just want to celebrate uh and, and so we were right in that niche hanging out up at mr gordy's house doing all that stuff and i'm thinking i'm the luckiest guy in the world i'm actually making yeah. money writing music and here then yeah. here's what happens then i get a house then i get a car the next thing i know i have to write music I have mm. to produce two pieces a week. I have to have a score for this movie ready mm. in three months. And I'm sitting at my piano, and the thing that liberated me is now my prison. 
And yep. I'm wondering, how in God's name does that happen? It's not the fault yeah. of music. But I learned yep. gradually, which again, that my book talks about, is that there's something in us that we're not aware of that becomes attached to and identified with a certain level of consciousness, a certain relationship to the world. And then one thinks that's what has to keep going if one is going to be sure. happy and content. So that's how why I left the music business. I became a prisoner of my own pleasure. It drove me crazy. Mm. I wanted to know how that happened. Mm. You know, I can so relate to that, too. I mean, I certainly didn't experience any of the level of success in the music industry that you did. Uh, my band got a development deal with Elektra Records for a minute, and we played with some big bands, you know, at the time. But um, I can so relate to that story because I remember the early days when when my band formed and, um, you know, coming together and writing songs. And and it was the, it's some of my best memories, like those late nights in our little rehearsal studio in Nashville, Tennessee yeah. at the time. and. <laughs> you know, all this creative energy and just fun and, you know, youthful, fun, beautiful, you know, expansive energy. And then yeah. fast forward a few years later, you know, our bass player's brother is in no doubt who had just had the biggest song on the FM dial, uh, you know, a few years before you were playing with these other really big bands and I'm start comparing to, okay, well, every, all these people around us are huge and, you know, uh, I'm spending every weekend at, you know, his house, no doubt's house one of the guys in no doubt's house that's been on cribs i need one of these how come we you know we're right there on the verge and then it turns into a job in a in a like I, we've got to make it somewhere and yeah. then then it went from being this joyous incredibly creative fun process to a job and comparison yeah. comparing ourselves to others and, right. and all those things and then it and it went it no longer became fun and so right. i i totally relate in that way so um and and that's been my biggest piece of advice guy since to people who are doing any sort of artistic endeavor from my firsthand experiences do it because you love it not to achieve some certain state with it right and if and, and something good will come from it especially if you're not attached to a particular outcome do it for the love of making the art and let the, the pieces fall where they may and uh, avoid that that trap of comparison and having to get somewhere with it and i think yeah. that's a tricky one for a lot of people making art yeah and and i don't really know brandon that one can avoid the uh, attachment and dependency it's kind of yeah. hardwired into our present level of consciousness to become identified with powers, possessions, pleasures, uh, position. We don't set out doing that. I never thought to myself that I would wind up uh, having to produce in order to keep in place a lifestyle. But that's exactly right. what happens. And then because you think other people see you this way and you feel yep. that you have to continue that, then the, it's it's really... It's, it's a significant thing because the root of that misunderstanding about relationship. Look, mm. one, why, do, why, why do you love music? Why do I love music? Why does anyone love music of any genre? The short answer is because when we're listening to it, it is stirring in us a quality or a character that were mm. we not An otherwise emotion. in that moment, yeah, we wouldn't be feeling that. So the relationship yep. serves as a revelation, key idea. All relationships mm. serve as revelation. This means that I gradually begin to want to experience certain feelings over and over again, and I actually become dependent on, we all know what that's like, trying to keep yep. this thing in place so that I can keep experiencing myself the way I want to. And when right. the relationship changes, which it must, suddenly right. I find myself trying to control the relationship so that I can keep the familiar identity. And then mm. all this resentment, pressure, unhappiness begins because now instead of this natural flow, there's a direction that I'm trying to make that relationship, not just with music, but with my partner, my family, right. the very moment itself. And now I'm a controller instead of a man or a woman enjoying what's naturally being expressed in the moment. 
Right, 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 right. And I'm assuming that's coming to an understanding of this over a, a, a long period of time. Now, you've been in a, in a relationship, uh, uh, a marriage for a long time, correct? Yeah. My wife and I have been together for almost 40 years. Wow. Longer than so you've been you definitely- alive. <laughs> Oh, well, actually, I'm just over that 40 mark, but uh, uh, I'm glad that you think that. (laughs) I feel like I'm 20, so that counts, right? Um, So let's let's talk about that. What inspired you to write this this book about relationships and what 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 have you learned? What wisdom do you have to depart today? And, and, you know, you've already departed some, but, um, you know, please give us the full download. Like what is, what, you know, what's going on with this book? What, what's different about it than other relationship books on the market is of course something that comes to mind as well. And um, yeah, just love to hear you kind of to, to talk about that a bit. Yeah. I like that question. Look, first, every book that I've ever written is about relationship, no matter what. Mm. Yeah. Because in the end, the whole of my life, as I stated at the outset, has been this wish to understand why is it that things unfold the way they do? And why am I so often caught up in a conflict, a fear, a worry, or a doubt, simply because something happens that I don't want to happen? So let's start with this idea. First and foremost, I said that relationships are actually the way in which we are introduced to parts of ourselves we don't know. So if that's true, and we get that we love happy human relationships, great physical relationships, all that, we love it. But why is it that when the one that I love, when my own brother or sister, when someone I'm working with, suddenly brings to mind or disrespects me or says something that's troublesome, why is that a problem? Why can't I love equally across the board? Why do I turn into someone who has an enemy? Here's what I've learned. First, we understand that when we look up at a night sky, we look at the ocean down in Costa Mesa, we see a a deer like one just walked across my patio here where I live in Southern Oregon. And Mm. we get an immediate feeling born out of that relationship of a quality of our own consciousness we do not ordinarily experience. So we love moments where we are shown loving, beautiful, gentle, wise things about ourselves. Yeah. The same relationship holds true with everything. So it's not just the moments that I want to know myself that are valuable. In fact, the most valuable moments are the instances where something is revealed in me that I don't know and that something in me has no interest in discovering. Because as long Mm. as I have that quality or character in me, in any relationship, and I don't know it's there until it's suddenly stirred awake, I am living with a limitation on the relationship. I'm living on right. a, with a relationship, a, a limitation between myself, the guy in the supermarket, a limitation on the freeway with the guy that cuts me off. Every last moment, without knowing this limitation, an, a hurt that's concealed in me, Until it's revealed, I am the body of that limitation, blaming others for the experience of it. Yeah, wow. That's the point. Yeah, that's that's very, very powerful. So it's, I mean, essentially what's happening is when these things are not uh, brought to the forefront of your consciousness, they're sort of influencing you unconsciously, right? Definitively. Look, an example. Um a man a, a man and a woman meet and we get we get it the everything is unbelievable i find no faults with you you god sent you to me the divine arranged this and and believe me in some mm. respects that's exactly what happened but sure so the first whatever it is one week two months a year but at a certain point 
because now we are beginning to know each other's story, we have moments where I start to see things in you that begin to trouble me. Now, why didn't I see them before? An example, in the relationship before the one I'm in now, I was betrayed. The, the woman of my dreams, the man of my Prince Charming, uh, got this wandering eye. And while they were professing endless love, were endlessly cheating on me, and I was too in love to know it, and now I discover yeah. it. So now, mm. in that moment, Brandon, without understanding the experience I had where my heart was broken, I go into this relationship, and anything that you do that even remotely looks like what happened in the last relationship sets off this fear alert. I don't understand that I'm looking at you through a set of eyes that belong to a past experience, but I begin to judge and weigh everything about you through this inherent limitation in the possibility of love. Now right. I begin to, I begin to press you, actually ask questions, worry, and produce in you resistance to my own state. So now you begin to push back at me and a, an old seed of a pain that was not resolved has sown itself into a resentment and inevitably the destruction of the relationship based on a limitation I never knew was living in me. Right, 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 right. Yeah, so it's like everything is sort of tinted with that that experience on a go forward if you if you're not aware if you're not in, in really in most cases people aren't really even that consciously aware of it exactly because there's a lot of things that we have we all feel certain kinds of inadequacy uh growing up for instance uh, i remember uh, there was one particular thing that always troubled me because i went to uh i went to beverly hills high school and, uh, you know, raised among very, very wealthy people. And if you didn't drive uh, a, a car that was a Porsche, you know, <laughs> or a brand new Camaro or whatever it was, you, you just weren't happening. And so you don't right. think to yourself that that scars you. But here you are, 40, 50, 60 years old. And for some reason, you feel you have to be embarrassed because you're driving a car not as good as someone else's. Where does that right, come right. from? And I'm explaining. It's all part of an interior relationship where we look at life through an old set of eyes that meet new moments, compare the moment or the relationship to what wasn't or should have been, and now we're playing catch-up, feeling inadequate. And our state begins to infect everyone else's state. This is a big mm. idea in my new book, Brandon. You, mm. you, you're with somebody. Everybody's having a bang up time. And then somebody says something, and one of the people you're with, without anybody knowing it, takes a personal affront to the comment. That person begins to literally vibrate that resistance, that negativity. Right. We feel their negativity, but right. mostly we're not aware of our feeling of their negativity. We begin to blame them for our feeling. And as we blame them mm. for our feeling, they blame us for their feeling. And we get this negative right. pattern that produces a very pernicious. Feedback. Really, yeah, exactly. Just exactly what it is. It is an emotional feedback loop of the negative kind produced by an unconscious nature resisting the revelation of itself. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. So what would you say? Okay, let's take that, that wonderful example that everyone can relate to and has been through. I would imagine that's hearing this. Um, what do you do in that moment to, to, break the the feedback loop right what 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 would be your advice the f the first thing we we just have to understand this no one wins a fight mm. period 
end of story if the outcome yeah. of every uh, encounter with my partner, my brother, my mother, the guy at work, the world itself, if the outcome every time is the same, which is essentially blame someone for my negativity, then that seed is not only reseeded, but this nature literally reincarnates, literally mm. reincarnates because nothing changed in it. We say, well, right. I'm learning through this experience, but I'm not learning through this experience other than to blame someone for something else that I don't want to know about myself. It's that simple. Mm. If the fight is going to produce light, meaning a new relationship, then one of us is going to have to understand that no one wins the fight. We're fighting because we're both in pain. We're both in pain because we don't understand something about ourselves that we're blaming on the other person. I'm going to do something new with my pain. I'm going to do mm. something new with my pain. You are not going to be blamed for it. Did you set it off? Did you reveal it in me, to me? Yes. But my pain is my pain, period. Yeah. And when I start yeah. to get that, Brandon, listen to this beautiful, the old definition of the word patience. You're going to faint. Are you ready? I'm ready. The old, old definition of patience is to suffer myself. Mm. To suffer wow. myself. We've completely lost the ability to realize that we're not perfect. <laughs> because we're so used to appearance. We pull off everything, man. If I can dress it, if I can walk it, if I can talk it, by God, I have to be it. But the facts right. are different. I'm not it. Or more accurately said, I am it, but I don't know that this it that I am in the moment when I'm negative isn't me. It's something that was mm -hmm. dragged forward from the past, embodied in the moment that struck that chord, and then becomes my consciousness. I can mm -hmm. let go of that nature only when I understand that nature has no right being in the present moment with me and my partner, so that its assertion is my limitation. My discovery mm. that its assertion is a limitation is the beginning of releasing myself from that unconscious part of myself that wants to punish anyone and everything that rubs me wrong. Mm. Yeah, you know what comes to mind when you're talking about this for me uh, is this this idea that uh, expectation is premeditated resentment, right? So if you have an expectation that someone should or shouldn't be feeling however they're feeling, that turns into it's inevitably going to be resentment. And if you can step completely outside of needing anyone to show up any way. I think of um, the book Untethered Soul by Michael Singer, and he talks about this as well, uh, how, yeah, essentially not only is the heart a physical valve, but it is an energetic uh, in, in spiritual valve, essentially. And so whenever you are moving into that negative state, you're essentially disconnecting yourself with the higher self source, whatever you want to call it, the universe, whatever you want to call it, you're disconnecting yourself. And now you have cut off your life force, the, the life force that is everything that gives you all of your, your good feelings is now cut off. And you're sort of, you're, you're starving for that, that energy. And so what he talks about in the untethered soul is the number one thing you want to work in can, once you become aware of this phenomenon, is to retrain yourself. The only thing that's important in any given interaction is that you leave your heart open because otherwise you lose. You instantly lose. You've cut off all of your, 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 you know, um, access to source energy, to love, to all the goodness. And so I found that as a, such a powerful 
thing. It's such a root level understanding. Whatever this interaction is, uh, let me let me get rid of expectation of how the other person shows up. And my main focus, and we all know those moments, like you gave a great example of when your heart shuts down, right? Oh, someone said something in the room, all is well. All of a sudden, someone took it a certain way um, and boom, their heart closed. Now they've cut off their flow of of energy from source and there's pain. (laughs) Uh, So I find this a very fascinating way to kind of look at this, this idea. Look, I I like everything that you said, but I, and I don't know the gentleman or the book, but I would, I would suggest we might even be able to look at this um, even a little more deeply because you nailed it when you said that without knowing it, uh, when people fail to meet our expectations, that it tends to get us negative. Mm-hmm. But and when we're negative, and to the next point, look, negativity is blind. You know, if we could carry around a, a, a sweatshirt, you know, and every time we got negative, instead of believing that we see the reason for it, understand that the minute that we're negative, we can't see anything at all other than what our mind is telling us is at fault so what we have to do and put together and this is what my new book relationship magic does can i be disappointed that you are not fulfilling some expectation of mine unless in the moment prior to you failing to live up to my expectation i'm sitting there with a demand in the closet of my consciousness that you fulfill my idea of what I am, what you're supposed to be, how this is supposed to go. And if you don't check off all the boxes, then you're at fault. But whose list is it, Brandon? That's the point. It's my list. And it's not even my list. It's something that was fabricated out of incomplete experience over time. And I become dependent on the world or you filling in these blanks. Otherwise, I feel like something's being taken from me. When nothing is being taken from me, to the contrary, something is being given to me in that moment. Because you're showing me I've come into that moment with this list of demands that apparently I didn't hand to you when we got married. You know, it's just there. Now, here's the point. I can't change my expectations, but I can drop the demands when I see what they do to me and my partner. But I Mm -hmm. cannot drop the demands until I become conscious of how destructive they are when I enable and enact them. Then we have a real chance to change the core of the heart because it's no longer surrounded by these shackles called unconscious demands on my partner. Right. Right. Yeah, that's that's powerful. Very very powerful. It's all about bringing this inner the inner self, you know, shining light on all the shadowy corners, right, that have been affecting and controlling our actions and our outcomes for, you know, a lifetime typically. Yeah. Look, have you ever been have you ever been uh, driving someplace with your friend or partner and you think you know the way to get there and your friend says, you know what, you're lost. Why don't we stop and ask? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but my wife and I. So before they even say, can I make a suggestion before the words even come out? Uh, You're already braced for a fight. (laughs) Right. right? So so here's the point. Who's braced for a fight? Mm. What is it in me that I don't know is driving the car that now drives the relationship into a gutter because I don't know this is in me? Here's a beautiful exercise from the book. In every one of these moments, then we'll talk about where we were about what patience is and how it plays into this. Imagine Mm -hmm. being able to say to your partner, mom, dad, brother, sister, anybody, 
when they say something that sets you off, being able to say, you know what? Thank you. I didn't know that about myself. Right. Thank you. I did not know that about myself. How different would that be in the moment where instead of picking up the sword to deflect the shield that you're holding up, I turn that around and look at my own reflection in the moment and see right. that all you've done is service the highest possibility of that moment by enabling me to see that I carry with me something that no longer serves a purpose in my life and certainly not in our partnership. That's the right. key. Yeah, that's huge. And that's something that I've actually had a conversation with um, uh, my friend Chris Jackson on the show, who's been a regular uh, co-host contributor at times. And he talks a lot about that very thing is like, you know, he puts it in a funny way uh, where he's like, oh, thank you for showing me what an asshole I've been. You know, <laughs> um, But it's like, you know, if you can come to the point where you are are really walking that it is such a powerful moment in i would say in in the evolution uh, of of a being and what they can now expect to start experiencing it's like to me that's sort of an indicator of okay you've entered rapid growth territory yeah you know <laughs> it's very much true and and we can strengthen this this is why my new book i feel is so different than other books on relationships because mm -hmm. we have to have new knowledge without new knowledge without the capacity to see ourselves through ideas that are not the protection of my pain but rather the revelation the revelation of it i can't do a thing so new self-knowledge becomes pivotal now let's look at how we gain some of that mm. has anybody ever changed you? Have you ever changed anybody by pointing out a fault in them? Or the minute that that happens, does the person bow their back and begin to actually defend the thing that you're asking them to see? Isn't that true? Mm hmm. Typically, so that, defense is what's yeah, happening. I mean, look, do you like having somebody say to you, you know, Brandon, God, man, let, what's wrong with you? Nobody likes <laughs> that, do we? Right. Nor no. do we like the quiet, passive aggressive comments where we right. know that they're pointing out a fault, but they don't say it directly, which really irritates us further. So here's, <laughs> right. the, point. here's the point. I've never in my life had a real epiphany that changed the way in which I see the moment or my partner that didn't come when finally I realized, you know what? I am impatient. I am an addict. I am uh, defensive. I am so selfish. I never let a person get a word in edgewise. I'm too busy telling them about myself, whatever it may be. In the moment where I see that character in myself is where the need to change myself is born. If we get that, then we should begin to understand that that's the same truth for our partner. They have to have space. If I'm pushing to change my partner, I'm just yeah. creating resistance in them which blinds yep. them to the very thing I'm asking them to see. But if I mm. give them space, born of patience, then they might have a chance to see, you know what? They're accusing me of having lost my temper, but I'm sitting there quietly. So who is it that's lost their temper? Ah, I, my partner did. They get a chance to see themselves as they are because I stopped trying to show them themselves as they are. That's a huge mm. trick, a huge, beautiful sort of the jujitsu of love, really mm. allowing the partner to see themselves because you let them uh, be caught up in their own force 
to see what is manhandling them and it's not you. Mm. Wow. Yeah. You know, what comes to mind, we were talking about music earlier. It, what comes to mind for me when you were just explaining that is the, the saying, you know, music is the space between the notes. And if you're allowing some space for, you know, this whole thing to breathe instead of like I've been very good at doing a lot of my uh, relationship uh, on my relationship resume. I'm sure a lot of my past partners would would uh, be happy to tell you about how many ideas, thoughts, opinions, judgments I had shoved down their their throat. And, um, you know, it's like, yeah, just allowing some space for it all and and patience is it truly is such an important powerful virtue that uh you know i know for me too uh, you know the biggest thing that i could use more of in my life is you know that so look there's a a story in the book about a little girl she goes to her father her father Mm -hmm. is a master gardener who grows mm-hmm. the most beautiful roses in the world. And the little girl naturally uh, loves the flowers, her father, and wants to be like her father. And then sure. certainly the, all my stories are spiritual uh, metaphor, analogy. Father being wisdom, little girl, Sophia, the soul being born. I want to be like my father. So right. he says, sweetheart, I want you to. And he gives her this beautiful little potted rose. He says, this is for you alone. You work with it. You grow it. And I'll tell you everything I know. So this little girl, not knowing anything, does as she thinks she's seen her father do. Three weeks later, she comes to dad, kind of weepy. What's wrong, sweetheart? My rose is wilting. It's dying. I don't know what's wrong. Well, come on, sugar. Let's go see. They go out to the garden. And he says, oh, my. What? She says, well, you see, you're supposed to take it out of the pot before you put it in the ground. (laughs) <laughs> it can't grow. It's root bound. Mm. That's our problem with right. our partners, with love, with our relationships. We're root bound. We're so mm. dead set on uh, maintaining some form of control over the condition so that our identity is never threatened that you never say anything that brings up something in me I don't want to see or know, that there's no room for me to grow. And when there's no room for me to grow, I can't give you room to grow. One of us has to provide space. And the only way in which space is provided is when we allow change to take place, not change we control or drive to continue keeping something in place, but change that is the natural outcome of something being born, dying, and being born again, moment to Mm. moment within us, because of what we're being given to see through that relationship in ourselves. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautifully, beautifully said. All right. Well, now seems like a good moment to take a quick minute to tell those of you who aren't familiar a bit about our sponsor, Gaia. I've been a big fan of Gaia for many years now, which is why they're the only content provider I've ever reached out to in regards to potentially supporting this podcast. So needless to say, I'm very excited they're now supporting the show. Gaia truly is my personal go-to source for streaming consciousness content on the web. They have an incredible 7,000 plus exclusive videos covering 5,000 years of wisdom. Just to give you an example, on the show Missing Links, the incredible researcher Greg Braden explores all the biggest questions concerning who we are, where we come from, where we're going, by connecting the missing links between science and spirituality to complete our understanding of humanity's history and to better understand the interconnectedness of all things. Awesome, right? And that's just one example. As you guys constantly hear me say, it's a daily conscious effort to maintain an elevated vibration. And if you're looking to go deep down the rabbit hole to do so, then Gaia is the best place I know of to do it, period. And you can sign up for your first month for only 99 cents at Gaia.com forward slash positive head. That's spelled G-A-I-A dot com forward slash positive head. Check it out. Something that I want to ask as well um, that instantly jumped out at in your title uh is the, this word magic 
you know, the, of course, the book is relationship magic, uh, waking up together. So how do you define magic in its relationship to, to the title of the book? Would you agree that if you were to travel deep into some third or fourth world back country, find some tribe of people that have had no you in contact, and then you simply opened your lighter and flipped it on, that they would think they were seeing magic. <laughs> Probably right? so. Because they have no way to comprehend how you can create fire out of what seems to be nothing. Mm. <clears throat> I call the book Relationship Magic because as an individual begins to work with these principles, they can create space out of nothing. They can create stronger, truer bonds with each other simply by refusing to try to hold another person. It's magical when we can drop a negative state, Brandon. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember the story, but it's famous about a, a young girl and her father more or less uh, pawned her off to the king because he told her uh, that she could st spin gold out of straw. Do you remember that old fairy tale? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um Yes, I do. Is that, um, oh, where she has the long hair, right? Um, no, 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 not with the long hair. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, anyway, the, the bottom line is, is that that's what we learn to do with this book. That's magic. Can I turn a moment that seems dark, painful, mm. and a repetitive negative pattern into something that's positive, life changing? Uh, yes, exactly. And love developing. Mm. That's true magic. That's alchemy. That is mm -hmm. taking a moment that is dark, and instead of letting it determine the course of the moment, change me, which is the father of the moment, into someone who allows my partner and myself to become different human beings a heartbeat later. That's magic. Mm. Yeah. And what about the second part of the title, Waking Up Together? What, what, is, what is that about? How would you describe that? Well, if I actually change the kind of person I am, let's take an example. Mm -hmm. um, let's say I'm a controlling person uh, prone to being impatient. Uh, my wife, mm -hmm. let's say, cannot stand the impatience because it hurts her. Everyone knows what it's like to be around an impatient, demanding person. It's just purely painful. So <laughs> right. one day, out of the clear blue sky, she does something that usually sets off the impatience. And I've begun to understand through experience that when I get impatient with her, it just drives her to be impatient with me. And we don't change. We just blame with bigger and bigger certainty, the other person. So one day, I'm sitting there, I feel the impatience coming up, and instead of embracing and incorporating it, I agree to suffer it myself without blaming anyone for my demand. I am now, in that moment, no longer the one that she expects me to be no longer being right. what she expects me to be, she has to change as well, because otherwise, what would she predicate her unhappiness on? I'm not who right. I was. She has room to be someone new, and we wake up together. One way or another, mm. we get to see things about ourselves that bring us into a new level of relationship. Yeah, very, very powerful. It's now turned into a positive feedback loop, right? That's exactly right. And, and even better than that, it proves the principle. Look, today, everybody on the planet, because of all the easy access to spiritual knowledge, everybody knows the words. We can all talk it. But to walk it, who? Yep. Another story. So we're talking mm -hmm. about actually beginning to not just acknowledge the truth that sets us free, but to act the knowledge 
in the moment so that we can be the evidence, the experience, the one who actually changes. And because of it, under physics, under the laws of physics, incidentally, when the observer changes, the observed changes. If I make the most minute change in my interior life, everything about my relationships around the world are instantaneously changed. That's what we're after. That's relationship yeah. magic. Yeah, love that. So based off of that, would you say it's possible, you know, certainly there's people out there listening who the relationship has gone down, you know, a, a dark path, I'm sure. And the the love is waning. Maybe, you know, it's well beyond its uh, shelf life from some perspectives would say, you know what I mean? There's a lot of hurt and past there um, oh, yeah. that someone can't, just can't forgive. Is it possible to restore a relationship uh, like that? Yes, and, and listen to this reason why I, I, I urge the listeners to lean in because just like a grain of sand that gets inside of an oyster, mm. it turns into a pearl because it irritates the, the, the oyster. Some mm. ideas are so beautiful, but they're also irritating once we actually mm. agree to understand them. Love mm. never blames. Love cannot separate. Love unifies. Mm. Love never disappears. So if there's a moment with my partner and it feels like there's no love there, it isn't love that's not there. Love is always there. We wouldn't be alive without it. What's not there in that moment is my understanding that by clinging to the past, proving to myself through my own pain that you're responsible for this waning in our relationship is to miss the meaning of the moment, which is that love is trying just to say, you know what, guy? How long are you going to hold your partner's feet to the fire for something that they can't and haven't changed? Now, please, Brandon, I am not talking about being in an abusive relationship. Sure. I go to great pains in the book to, to, to spell out. If someone is abusing you physically, psychologically, and you yeah. have told them they are doing that and they continue to do it, guess who's responsible for the abuse now? Right. Something in you that actually enables them by staying in that relationship. We need to right. understand that. But apart from that, we're now talking about that what seems to be, to me very beautifully, every relationship, just like the seasons of the year, move through stages. There is the you bring out the best in me. Then there is the you bring out the rest in me. And then there is you bring out what I need to see that as I do will change our relationship. Because if mm. I can grow, I will no longer look at you as the reason for why I'm not. You know, relationships fizzle out because we tend to say my partner isn't changing. Isn't that so? Yeah. Yeah. Well, let us be the one who changes. Let us be the one who understands the reason there's boredom is because there's a pattern. And the reason there's a pattern is because it keeps everything in place that keeps me as I am. Am I willing to step outside of the pattern, outside of those old uh, ways in which I respond? Because if I am, I will give you the room to do the same. And then we'll begin like the little girl, take the thing out of the pot, put it in the ground, right. let it grow new roots. Then it gets new nourishment. The heart is rev uh, uh, revivified. It opens up. All of the lines are reconnected to the love that brought us together and something new happens. That's love. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Can, would you say that is the number one, I mean, sort of practice or is there, is there any particular, you know, exercise that you would recommend or, you know, sort of sometimes gamifying things makes it uh, a little easier. Um, is there any, so do you have any kind of like example or exercise to help couples uh, go down this path and renew the relationship? Of course. 
but I need to bring you in on this. All right. I'm, I'm all right. hoping I'm hoping that you play golf. Do you play golf? I've played golf. Uh, I w- I don't play regularly, but I have played. Okay. Um, is there anything? Well, you are a musician. Mm-hmm. Or you are a musician. I, I just want to mm-hmm. get this one point across. Like I'm, I, it's my, my activity is golf. I love golf. And gotcha. what, what, what happens is that a person comes out and basically learn slowly without knowing it. You learn how to perfect imperfection. <laughs> you, you just right, keep doing right. this, you know, you keep doing the same thing, hoping for a different result. And right. you don't get a different result. Well, it's very much true in relationships. We keep doing the same yeah. thing, opening for a different result. So now, to the point, when at last, it's so painful to keep doing the same thing and realize that there is another possibility. I wouldn't be in this if I didn't see there was something, hadn't felt there was another way to go about it. But when I go about the new way, it feels very uncomfortable to me. It's not familiar. Right. 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 All right. We have to see that when we really begin to make the kind of changes we're going to talk about, there is going to be nothing more uncomfortable than this. Why? Because we're not practicing imperfection anymore. We're changing the outcome by changing what starts the problem. So in my book, it's called the ABCs of relationship magic. These are three things that if a person really wants to change their relationship, they have to stop doing, not start something, some new idea. Mm. We're going to go away once a weekend. Uh, you know, we're going to take hot tub baths and re-stimulate our relationship or whatever <laughs> right. it is. You know, the, the, right. we've done all that. It doesn't do squat. All it does is we turn into a prune up. after 10 minutes in that hot yeah, tub. <laughs> you know, yeah. It sends a skyrocket up that's then dead on the ground. <laughs> so what are the ABCs? The three things that we are to stop doing. And please listen, not because we have some idea not to do it, but because we see for ourselves that the very actions that we're going to stop doing are responsible for the continuity of what we no longer want. The ABCs, Mm. A, anger. Write it down, Mm. listeners. Anger is a blinding force. When we are angry, we are blind, pure and simple. We cannot see what is right before our eyes. This is a true life experience of mine. It's in the book. I was standing in line at a supermarket, and a man walked up and literally rolled his uh, cart over my foot. Now, when someone hurts you and you don't see it coming, do you turn around and go, gee, that's beautiful. Thank you, man. Or do you, <laughs> or do you instantaneously get negative? We get negative. Mm-hmm. You're invading my True. space. You've hurt me. So I had an mm-hmm. instantaneous negative reaction. And then I turned around. And what do you think I saw? A man with a red tipped cane. Mm. He couldn't help doing what he did. He couldn't see clearly. When I could see that he couldn't see, my negativity went away and I gave him the spot in front of me because anger is blind. But when we see that anger is blind and how limiting it is, then we're suddenly open to compassion. We're suddenly open to a completely change, change the relationship. So when we're angry with our partner, we are blind to the fact that they are blind because they couldn't be hurting us if they could see. Mm. Wow. See how beautiful that is, Brandon? Absolutely. No one wants to hurt another human being. Real consciousness can't do that. So if I understand when my partner hurts me that they are literally in the dark, in pain, 
without knowing they're in pain because they're blaming me for their experience. Then I turn right. around and do the same thing. Anger is a blinding force. That's the first A. We have to see that if we're angry, we can't see our partner in any way or form. The, the B of the ABC, blame. Blame is the extension of anger. While anger is a blinding force, blame is a binding force. Mm. When we blame our partner, we bind ourselves into an unconscious pact of pain based on the idea we are somehow or other feeling what we are because of what our partner's doing. But if I actually get it, that my partner couldn't see and can't doing what they're doing to me, and instead of getting angry and turning around and blaming them, now they can't turn and fight with me because I'm not fighting with them. Where are they right. going to go with their pain, Brandon? What's going to happen to my partner's pain if I don't mm. validate it by pushing back? What's going to happen? They're going to be, they're going to be uh, like the Buddha, the story of the Buddha where the man came up to him and screaming at him, you shouldn't be teaching people. You have no right. And, um, and he asked him, uh, if, if uh, someone offers you a gift and you don't accept it, who, who's left with the gift? <laughs> and the guy's like, well, I am. And he's like, that's exactly what I'm doing with your anger. <laughs> you know, you, you get to keep it. That is exactly right. And when you get to keep it, you will eventually come to see it. And when mm -hmm. you come to see it, without something to blame for it, you will want to be a different human being. Mm. So by refusing to get angry, I'm still feeling the anger. We're not going to pretend we're not angry, but now I'm going to patiently suffer my own nature. Mm. And then when I patiently suffer my own nature and don't blame you, you're going to get a chance to patiently suffer your nature. Uh. So the A, B brings us to the C. No coercion. Refuse mm. to coerce. Oh, man. How many millions of ways do we have of coercing our partner into acquiescing or otherwise changing their behavior? Why? So as to avoid my blame and my anger. So all we're really doing when we coerce our partner is literally corralling them into an unconscious nature that will eventually walk away and then bring resentment back into the moment because they, co they, they collapsed into the coercion. They gave in because they thought that would fix stuff. And now the seed is sown even more deeply so that the next situation will produce an inflamed set of reactions instead of the light that would be born if we practiced the ABCs of relationship magic. Mm, yeah, those are all very powerful. If we can understand them, not out of the box, we're all in training, Brandon. We're in training. I need to understand that I have a temper problem, that I'm self-centered, that I blame quickly, that I'm full of guilt over my past, that I'm defensive at the drop of a hat because my teacher, when I was in third grade, told me I would never amount to anything. I'm jealous because my brother won most likely to succeed in the yearbook. Whatever it is, these seeds of ourself are carried forward in an unconscious nature. Life yeah. in its graciousness, in its mercy, through our relationships, provides a way to reveal and release us from these concealed, limiting parts of ourselves. That's the beauty mm -hmm. of it. That's the magic. And that's what waking up together is all about. Mm. When you understand that it's happening for you, right, yes. is a big, big, big uh, turning point for people. You know, I, I believe, you know, life's not happening to you. It's happening for you and through you. And, exactly. you know, it's, I, I referenced my friend Chris earlier. He also talks about, you know, 
taking relationships and turning them into relationships. And I feel like that's what you've given us sort of the formula for over the course of this whole this whole conversation. It is because we begin to come to that marvelous point again in the book in Jerry Maguire. What did he say to Dorothy? Mm. You complete me. Mm. You complete me, but not because of the love that we, uh, how do I say this? But not because of all the things that you and I went through. I was attracted to you because I thought you could get me through this hard time. You were attracted to me because you wanted a man for your son. So we both wanted mm -hmm. each other for wrong reasons, but we actually mm -hmm. helped each other see the wrong reasons we wanted each other for, behind which mm -hmm. was a weakness that he thought, I'll never make it without somebody to kind of carry me through this. She thought, I'm not good enough to raise my son without a man. And then we both learn through each other that there is something that we have with each other that completes us. So that's why he said, you complete mm. me, because you showed mm. me what I couldn't see about myself. And I'm so grateful for being released from that selfish nature. She's so grateful for being released from the idea that without a man, she was nothing. So you have these beautiful marriage that only love can produce. Mm. Yeah, I, I like that uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I, I just want to, I just realized I, I misquoted the way Chris says it. He says, taking it from relationships to relationships, <laughs> which is more appropriate. And uh, I just, I wanted to clarify that because I feel like it's an important point. And, um, you know, what, what you just said is interesting because I've often thought this idea of finding your other half or what have you is sort of a an incorrect notion like because we're whole beings right like a lot of times people are trying to fill some some broken part of themselves through the other but in the context of the way you just painted it with you completing me it's like ah okay you you act as a you know as a sort of a prop if you will to allow me or help me to complete myself so that i am that whole being so it's 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 sort of an interesting uh perspective on all that i feel you, you touched on something i really want to pinpoint part of the reason we have these problems with our partner is because our mind is kind of set into a notion where we're going to arrive at a fixed perfection there's no such thing as a fixed perfection. Anything mm. that's fixed isn't free. So mm. that anything that isn't free can't be perfect. Our mm -hmm. relationship is meant to be alive, changing mm -hmm. moment to moment. You know, a sitar, the East Indian instrument, has some major strings and then a host of what they call sympathetic strings. You strike one string, the sympathetic strings all sound out, rounding out the basis of the instrument. Every one of us is a kind of sitar. We are literally an infinite number of strings of light, of love, whatever you want to call it, wisdom, different kinds. And everyone around us is sounding out what they're sounding out. We can't know the strings in us that sound out until we're around what creates the resonation. The resonation mm. is the revelation, and it is a living sound. It is a living music. And if we can start to understand that in any good music, there's always passages that are dissonant. There's always chords that move us from one section to another that seem like they're yeah. committing conflict, but they're leading to a resolution so that we get this yeah. idea that everything is intended to be new and renewed and renewed again through this real relationship with our partner. Beautifully said. Very, very powerful information here today. Uh, definitely have enjoyed going down this rabbit hole because it's a big one. It's a big one for, you know, everyone and even outside of romantic relationship, right? I mean, we have relationships oh, yeah. with our children, our family, our friends, our coworkers. It's like if we can move into a state where we're really understanding how to navigate relationship as a whole, uh, better in our, in our world. I mean, everything spawns from that, right? Would you agree? 
Absolutely. I, in fact, I can't stress it strongly enough. We need to all have the epiphany, as difficult as it is, to realize that there is something in us that resents or hates others because they don't love in the same way that we do. Mm. That's the most massive contradiction, and we all <laughs> live with it. Yeah. We live with it without knowing it because when we are busy pushing, pulling, resenting, we're blind, thinking that we can yeah. see. This yeah. book is about helping the individual open his or her eyes, not just to their partner but to their mother, their father, their brother, their sister, their siblings, the person they work with, their employees, the guy at the gas station, the, the, the political party, across the board, Brandon, without mm. understanding love and beginning to become its authentic instrument, this world is going to fall apart because it keeps dividing itself up into more and more groups, each of who says they have the answer to heal. Groups yeah. don't heal. Love heals by showing where divisive thinking produces dark relationships. And until we can mm -hmm. change the interior dynamic, we're going to continue to see an exterior frantic world pulling itself apart. Yeah. Wow. Well said. I do. Uh, I do have a question here for you as we wind down, though, that uh, is a little maybe off topic. Maybe it, it ties in. I don't know. But I love hearing stories, as the listeners know, of synchronicity, uh, serendipity, positive paranormal story, uh, something sort of magical. And I got to think that you have something magical up your sleeve. I, I do. I'll take that I laugh as a as a yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm hesitant. I'm hesitant to uh, set up the story. Uh, I and I can only think of one or two times um, in my whole life where I have mentioned this incident that happened when I was 11 years old. But it would. I just realized how perfectly it it actually uh, set the stage for the story I want to tell you. Do we have time for two mm. short stories? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I always have time for a good story. When I when I was, I don't know, Brandon, I was 11 years old, 11 or 12 years old. I'd already had certain spiritual longings. I, I kind of mm. came in like that. I was writing poetry, like at the age of nine, spiritual poetry. That's wow. how I got started in the music business as a lyricist. <laughs> wow. And I was in my closet in my house. I had a walk-in closet as a boy. Told you I came from a well-to-do family. Mm -hmm. And I remember just as clearly as I'm sitting here talking to you, I reached up for a shirt. And I heard in my head, as clearly as I hear you speaking to me or my own voice, a voice. And it said, with this pain, I give thee life and do thee wed. And I, wow. I, 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 I looked around. I, was somebody in my room? No. Yeah. I walked out into the bedroom. I go, I said, what? I actually said, what out loud? And it repeated. It wasn't a male voice. It wasn't a female voice, but it was pure. It said, with this pain, I give thee life and do thee wed. Now, what do you do wow. when you're 11 years old? I wrote it down. <laughs> That's I a heavy a, statement, too. Oh, my God. I wrote it down, and 30 years later, I begin to understand it. 40 years later, I'm starting to really get it. 50 years later, I'm diagnosed with type 1 carcinoma on my vocal cords. Oh, cancer. Wow. And by grace... My brother uh, is the director of a cancer hospital out of the University of Pittsburgh. And he knows this doctor back then. This is 17 years ago now. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Am I clear 17 years? 90s, 97? What? Wow, yeah, that's like, 20. Like that's 15, 21 years. years. Any, yeah. Anyway, and this guy's doing this really advanced microsurgery. Wonderful doctor. Became a friend of mine. 
But over a period of seven months, Brandon, I had to have six surgeries on my vocal cords. Wow. Now, I don't know if you can imagine it, but I can tell you that in order to do that, they have to almost pull your tongue out <laughs> to get down oh, into man. your cords Whoa. so that each and every subsequent surgery was the most painful thing in the world. And the last surgery I'm hoping will be the one where I finally get clear margins. I'm laying on the recovery room in the, un in the hospital at the University of Pittsburgh, and I'm coming to, and Brandon, I, I don't know, I, I write the story in the book. I'm in so much pain, and I'm thinking, I can't go through this again. I yeah. cannot do it again. And I start crying, feeling sorry mm. for myself. Some might say you have a reason to, but I, I don't ever feel that that's right. But I'm, I'm, I'm starting to weep out of self-pity. And I don't know if you can understand this, but it hurts sure. all the more my throat. And then right. I, I turn my head over, Brandon, and in the recovery room with me about, oh, I don't know, 15 yards away, I look and I see an old woman. And she's sitting there and I can tell instantaneously that her face has gone through some major reconstruction surgery because part of it's all covered with a bandage and she looks like she's had some something taken off of her, obviously cancer. And she's sitting there and she's holding hands with her husband, an old man, and she's stroking his hand. Brandon, in that moment when I saw her and her husband and the amount of pain that she had to have been in, which had to be greater than my own, with God mm. as my witness, my pain disappeared. Wow. And not only did... Not only did my pain disappear, but it became unimportant. And I, I, if you've ever had surgery, you're not supposed to get up. But I got up with my sheet barely covering the back end of myself. And I stumbled over to this old couple. And I, I walked over and I took her hand. And I'm not, you're not supposed to say a thing. And I, with, with, again, as God in my witness, out of my mouth came whispering these words. It's gonna be all right. Wow. It's gonna it's gonna be all right. And she teared up, he teared up, I teared up, and all of us were free from our pain, from the suffering wow. in it. Not the pain itself, the pain's there, but the self-pity, the fear, all of it gone in a heartbeat. Why? Wow. Love. Mm. Pure and simple something that unites wow. us in a relationship bigger than ourselves, but yet through that relationship and its magic reveals another order of self that lives at a completely different level that can use everything to prove its own existence so that one leaves that, as I did, convinced ever more deeply that there is another kind of relationship we're meant to be in with each other where if we can be present to each other, including each other's pain, we are released from the self-centered selfishness that is the root of most of our pain in our partnerships. Mm. Wow. What can a you powerful see story. That, can you see how all that ties in? Absolutely. Absolutely. Incredibly beautiful story. It changed me. I mean, obviously, that's why I wrote it in the book. Because how is it possible I could be on the verge of, you know, like wishing I wasn't alive to being grateful for being alive? Mm. Because something happens in a relationship that shows you that the you that you don't want to be really isn't you at all. It's just a phase. It's a level of being that can be mm -hmm. shifted instantaneously under the right circumstances, which happened in one respect accidentally there. But you and I have been talking about how we can change those circumstances consciously so right. that we can see the pain of our partner and realize that I don't want to add to my partner's pain. If I know they're in pain, why would I want to add anything to them? I love them. Love mm -hmm. doesn't add pain to a partnership. So these ideas 
once seated in and beginning to act on them, work as stages of revelation. So we get to see, you know what? There is something in me that cannot see what it needs to see. But every time I do, by God, I exit that moment a different order of man than the one who went into it. And thank heavens for that. Yeah, absolutely incredible. This has been such an amazing journey, Guy. Um, did Now, did, did you cover everything you wanted as far as stories? Because you mentioned two. Did you have Not another one? Close. <laughs> Not even close, <laughs> but certainly good enough. <laughs> Oh, wow. Well, maybe we'll have to do this again sometime because this, uh, I feel like, yeah, I, I do. I feel that like there's so much more wisdom that you could share. And I've so thoroughly enjoyed this. And I know the listeners have as well. For those who want to continue to follow you and your work and what's the best way for them to connect? Well, there's two ways. One is to go to, you have to tell me the, the opening URL. For, for you guys to navigate to it, it's positivehead.com forward slash relationship magic is what, That's right. uh, what we'll say. Positivehead.com slash uh, forward slash relationship magic. If you go to Brandon's site, you'll be guided, if you wish, to where you can buy the book and in the purchase of the book, be able to receive three free gifts right on the spot. A download of the audio book, which I've read. A, a three hour webinar I did on waking up together and a free 60 minute MP3 about seven ways to awaken higher, happier love in a relationship. So immediate three gifts. If you just want to find wow. out about me and my work, you can go to www.guyfinley.org, G U Y F I N L E Y.org. So the the, the relationship through Positive Head will allow you to get the book at a great price, get you the free gifts, really a marvelous value. Uh, and if you just want data, if you want information to learn more about my work, go to guyfinley.org. Uh, excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I, that's very gracious of you. Uh, all, all three of those things with a book, I would say have, uh, tremendous value. Uh, you know, audio books is something I've really started to enjoy in the last year or so more than ever myself. And, you know, cause I can, I can drive and listen or what have you. And, uh, although I still love to have a physical book too, there's, you know, different, different circumstances and times call for, for different things. So it's nice to have both. And, uh, certainly the other, the, the webinar and MP3, both of those sound really, really great. So, uh, much appreciation for you, uh, willing to do that for, for the positive head listeners. Once again, guys, it's uh, positivehead.com forward slash relationship magic. Uh, all one word. If you want to, uh, want to, uh, take advantage of that um this has been amazing as i mentioned guy thank you so much for taking the time to come on and connect and i do have one last question i'd like to leave you with and uh that it that is this in 60 seconds or less what is the meaning of life according to guy finley the meaning of life cannot be separated from discovering our purpose as individuals on the planet. Our purpose is to be a living instrument of whatever you want to call it. We can simply call it love. So that in our relationship with a different kind of love, we can each of us become a different order of human being and begin to connect all of the worlds that exist and that we live in and upon into a singularity that cannot hurt itself or anyone else and that continues to prove through time its inherent perfection. Mm. You are a poet indeed, my friend, and uh, thank you <laughs> for, for showing up. Thank you for being. This has been quite the, the pleasure. And I feel the same, Brandon. It was pleasure. It was a pleasure to talk to you. You're, you're, uh, it, it, you're, a, you are a marvelous, <laughs> marvelous. You, you do marvelous. a wonderful job. Thank, thank oh, you for thank the you. opportunity. And I hope we can oh. talk again. And if nothing else, look, I speak three times a week up here in Southern Oregon. Not that oh, far. Right. Oh. There's nothing to join. It's a $3 donation at the door. Uh, 
come on up. If you ever get the chance, you'd be my guest. Yeah, I would love that. Where is that? Maybe throw that out there for people. So uh, where is is uh, this at? We're, my foundation is located on 15 acres of old growth sugar pine, just north of Grants Pass, Oregon. And for those that don't know that, it's about 65 miles north of the California border, right on the I-5. Okay. And my foundation okay. is in Merlin, like the wizard, Merlin, Oregon. <laughs> How perfect uh, that the, the, the magician himself would be in Merlin. And that's the Life of Learning Foundation. Is it? That's, that's the name? That's correct. Life of Learning Foundation. And Excellent. you can find I'm information about the events. Yeah. If you go to GuyFinley.org, uh, you can learn all about the ongoing classes, the wisdom school that we have, uh, a host of wonderful things. Just visit. Excellent. 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 I love that. I'm glad we got that out there. That's, that's, that's huge. And I know, uh, especially my, my, uh, the P heads, as I affectionately refer to them as uh, in, uh, in that part of the, the world are going to be glad that we got that out here at the last second. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad we circled back. Uh, guy, thank you again, my friend. This has been such a, such a pleasure until next time. Journey well. You too. Thank you. Well, everyone, that concludes this week's interview episode. Before we sign off, I wanted to let you all know that we have finally created the Game with the Universe on our website where you can choose the first number that comes to your mind and it'll pull up that episode number of the podcast. I've been saying this is a great way to co-create synchronicity and magic with your higher self for quite some time by doing this manually. But now if you go to positivehead.com, forward slash Y-O universe. There is a super fun and simple interface to play this game with your higher self. I firmly believe just by setting the intention to play in this way, it opens up the door for magic and it's a synchronistic way to hone in on nuggets of wisdom out of the huge catalog of episodes that are specifically appropriate for you at this time in your journey to becoming the next greatest and grandest version of yourself. And it also makes for a super fun way to engage and invite friends, family, people on social media to check out the podcast as well. So be sure to check out positivehead.com forward slash Y-O-U-N-I-V-E-R-S-E and be sure to tell all your friends so they can play a game with the universe, which also helps the show to reach new people, which I greatly appreciate. And as a quick reminder, be sure to also check out positivehead.com forward slash transformation if you're curious to learn more about Purium Superfoods and why I take them every day. On this journey of becoming the next greatest and grandest version of ourselves that we have all embarked upon, I can't stress the importance of managing your physical vibration enough. And quite honestly, Purium has put together the simplest plan I've found to do so, and I'm sincerely excited to share it with all of you. Otherwise, as you continue on your fabulous journey in this 3D reality, be sure to remember this. As long as you ain't dead, you're already positive ahead. Journey well, everyone, and thank you for being.